Hello, and welcome to FFRF's Ask an Atheist. I'm Rebecca Markert, the legal director here at the Freedom From Religion Foundation. And I'm Liz Cavell, associate counsel at FFRF. In today's episode, we are going to talk with author Kimberly Newton to talk about her new children's book, Goodbye, Sister. So this is a very busy week here at FFRF. It's our 46th annual convention this weekend, Friday and Saturday. So because of this, we're actually pre-recording this show on Monday, but we still want to hear all your comments or questions on this subject. And as always, you can leave thoughts in the Facebook chat or the comments below. You can email them to askanatheist at FFRF.org. So today's guest is, again, Kimberly Newton. Many of our viewers may know Kim. She was formerly the executive director of Camp Quest. That's an organization that runs secular co-ed summer camps for kids age 5 to 17. She recently wrote Goodbye, Sister. It's a book for children under 10 years old about grieving the loss of an infant sibling. Um, and Kim is also an educator. She teaches high school English and drama. So welcome to the show, Kim. We're so happy to have you. Thank you so much for having me, Liz and Rebecca. I was really excited to have you on our show to talk about this book because it's not only a fantastic book, but also because October is Pregnancy and Infant Loss Awareness Month. Um, many people may know I had a stillborn daughter in 2010 and have since had four living children. And finding ways to talk about their dead sister has always been a challenge. So when you reached out about this project, I was really excited and interested to learn more. So let's start talking about this project. What inspired you to write this book? Well, um, the story is based on, also based on my loss, Rebecca, and thank you for sharing about yours. Um, as you mentioned, that October is Pregnancy and Infant Loss Awareness Month, and um, I think that the conversation around infant loss, stillbirth, miscarriage, and termination um, is still very much a taboo topic. Um, but I think we are fortunate to be in a time when um, families affected by this kind of loss are starting to find their voices and starting to find supportive communities. And um, so the story is based on my family's experience of losing my sister Katie in 1992. And I was four and a half years old. I was anxiously um, awaiting the day that my baby sister would be born and that I would be a big sister. And um, she very tragically was stillborn. And instead of celebrating a new life, we were thrown into grief. And um, I have very vivid memories of this time. Um, they're among my earliest memories because I spent that summer living with my grandparents while my father worked three jobs to pay my mother's hospital bills um, and then to pay for a funeral. Um, and as I grew older, I came to really understand what a significant impact the loss of Katie had on our lives. Um, not just because we were navigating grief, um, but because my parents still envisioned that I would be a big sister, that they would have other children. And they became foster and adoptive parents. Um, so I grew up in a family with foster children, um, and adopted siblings. And to sort of fast forward to why this story and why now, um, in 2020, as the world was coming into, you know, into the grips of the COVID pandemic, um, I was, you know, with Camp Quest and we were pivot pivoting pretty well to online camps. And that summer, my adopted brother was very tragically killed. Um, and it was in processing my grief for him that I realized I really needed to revisit the grief of losing my sister. And um, I had written the story 
of Goodbye Sister some years before that, but had kind of dismissed it. I had dismissed my own story of loss because I thought no one will want to read a book about a baby that dies. And not only that, but when I went to search for other similar books, what I found um, and what maybe you found too, Rebecca, is that much of the children's literature out there um, creates a narrative centered around Christian theology, that we were going to have a baby, but we had an angel instead, or um, our baby is in heaven now, or our baby has wings and is looking over me. And um, at that time, I was and still am a young mother. At, at the time that I wrote Goodbye Sister, I didn't have any children. In 2020, my daughter was three. And I found myself trying to explain death to her, but through my new lens of humanism, um, without trying to explain death in any other terms other than what I knew to be truthful and scientifically accurate. So when I set out to share my story about Katie, I needed to rewrite that narrative without the piece that was layered in for me at the time that I was a child. Um, so I did intentionally set out to write a secular book um, because there, I couldn't find any. <laughs> and, and I knew as well that I had, I had then close friends, other parents, who had also experienced similar losses and who also had older children who were going through the same loss I had. And so that really opened my, my eyes to the need for this story and for similar literature. Um, so I decided and my husband decided to invest in self-publishing um, because I, I tried the traditional publishing route and I got a lot of no's. I got, I got some kind messages back like, this is such an important book. It's just not for us, you know? Um, and so through self-publishing last October, I took the book um, and my kind of first time sharing it publicly was at a lo very small local event um, for the Sadie Rose Foundation, which was started 16 years ago by a local couple whose daughter was stillborn. And, um, and just through seeing the impact that it made on the families there, this small little community gathering gave me the courage then to take the story to the Pregnancy, Loss, and Infant Death Alliance Conference all the way in Denver, Colorado, where I shared it with clinicians and neonatal nurses and thanatologists who were so appreciative, not only to see a beautiful children's book about this subject, but one that they could share in a clinical setting because it's secular. Um, and because they can put it in the hands of any family, regardless of their religious or non-religious belief, and be offering them something that will bring them comfort. So I completely know what you're talking about, obviously, about trying to find books that explain it. Um, I'm part of a local support group here in the Madison area in Wisconsin, and my loss was 13 years ago, and I remember being handed one of those books. They had um, two books available at the time. One was what you had mentioned before, we were going to have a baby, but we had an angel instead. And then the other book was Someone Came Before You, which was more applicable to me because, you know, my, my daughter was, uh, my daughter Lily was my first child. Um, and so when I went on to have more children, you know, her, Death was so part of my life um, that we knew we were going to talk about her with our subsequent children, but didn't really know how. And so I did grab that book, but it is 
it's about a little angel baby that sits on the shoulder of mom and dad and helps them through the grieving process. And so um, it's really hard to be like, oh, yeah, like this is just a cute little like depiction of, of a baby. And, you know, we tried to talk about how that baby represented the love that we had for the baby and things like that. But obviously, like the imagery is so stark um, and it was really hard. So when you reached out to me about this project, because over this past weekend, I was a keynote speaker at a Forever in Our Hearts event, and you saw that on, I don't know if it was LinkedIn or Facebook or something like that, but you reached out and you said, I have a book that you guys might be interested in, and it was exactly what I needed 13 years ago, and I know so many people from our support group who reached out to me when I mentioned in, in our support group that I wasn't religious and they like secretly messaged me afterwards and said, thank you because you know, like we, we're not religious either. And like, it's hard when you're in these support groups and they're talking about God and angels and all of that stuff over and over again. And even in a place like Madison, especially in the, the grieving community, this idea of an afterlife and like the babies and people watching over you is so strong. And sometimes you think like, I want, I want to feel that too, because it, it's somewhat comforting to think, yes, like they're still with us. But um, it's also really hard for people who are atheists, agnostics and humanists to just have those platitudes thrown at you. So I definitely think there's a, a dearth in the, the grieving books community, especially for children. And I think this is a wonderful project and something that's so needed. But why do you think it's important just overall for people to have access for books for children about the grieving process? Um, I think, you know, as we as we come to, of course, adulthood, right? Um, we are inevitably faced with death. And it, you know, as informed as we might be about how important it is to talk about it, um, to seek help, to seek out communities like you did, Rebecca, um, for support, um, when it comes to including children in our grieving process, it's incredibly difficult. I mean, just as a parent, you know, who, you know, as I was trying to grieve the loss of my brother, I, I mean, I could barely function. I, 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 I suffered a mental breakdown. Um, I ended up in the hospital. I'm, I'm, this is the first time I'm, sh I'm sharing about this. Um, I could barely take care of myself. Um, and making space for my daughter and my husband in those moments of despair was incredibly difficult. Um, and I think that having a book, right, is a concrete, tangible reminder of the fact that we can and should create space for connection. Um, and so, in my kind of book journey and my author journey, I've been so fortunate to connect with some other like-minded authors who are out there creating accessible, evidence-based books about grief for children. Um, and I think that, and well, I hope that it's just kind of the tip of the iceberg um, in terms of incorporating what we know about children's social emotional development with literacy and topics that make a profound impact on a child's life um, in those moments when they need a book the most. Um, and, you know, and I don't think that you necessarily have to have children <laughs> to appreciate uh, a children's book, you know, um, we were all children at one time, right? So I wrote this not as a grieving mother, but as a grieving sibling, right? As a brief sibling. And so being able to make those connections now, you know, 35 years later um, has been incredibly healing for me, you know, grief, the grief um, journey we know isn't, it doesn't end 
you know, three months after <laughs> after the death of your loved one or your or your child or your um, to be baby sister or brother. Um, it's kind of a journey that we're all on, and it's one that I'm uh, I continue to find myself on, and that's kind of shaping now my life, my professional trajectory. Um, this experience has inspired me to. Um, this spring, I'll be studying to be an end of life doula um, because I see that we need more humanistic representation uh, and end of life and bereavement services. Um, I'm a humanist celebrant, and that's been a very rewarding part of my journey um, to be able to serve other atheist, humanist, secular, and interfaith couples. So I'm trying to pull all the threads together in a way that's meaningful and healing to me. Um, and so I think that, um, I hope that Goodbye Sister inspires others to do the same, you know, with whatever story it was that they needed when they were a child. So Kim, obviously you were intentional about making this a secular book. Um, and just to briefly explain uh, if it hasn't come across, what we mean by that is that there's no references to the supernatural, to God, angels, heaven, or an afterlife. Um, can we talk a little bit about that um, and how you think about um, talking to kids about grief in a totally evidence-based way, why that's important to you. I've talked on this show before and with Rebecca about um, this topic, right? Thinking about grief as a, a non-religious person. Um, and I'm a mom too. I have three kids and we've dealt with grief in the family um, at, you know, when they're impossibly young and innocent and vulnerable. And it's like the one time as a non-religious person when I just wish so hard that those um, types of explanations did resonate with me or that felt didn't feel false to me because um, it is so hard to present our, our kids with the reality of, of grief and loss and, and teach them to sit with it because it's so hard for us um, and so painful. And so I'm just curious kind of how you think about that, how you thought about that when you were creating this book um, and why you think it's it's so vital or how you explain that um, to people when you're talking about the book. Um, I definitely found myself as I was going through the revision process, which by the way, took many years actually. So I wrote the manuscript for Goodbye Sister when I was visiting the Virginia Children's Book Festival in 2015, um, my job at the time took me there. So this was even before Camp Quest. Um, and a, another illustrator, author, and I were talking and he posed this question to me of, so what book are you working on? And I was like, not me, I'm not working on any book. <laughs> and he was like, no, no, no. You need to write the book that you needed when you were a child. And so that always stuck with me of like the book that I didn't have was one to help me in my grieving process with Katie. And the reason why I think it's important that we, that we work to explain death and dying and grief in concrete terms um, using very clear language is because this is what we know children need in order to process their understanding of the world, especially those children who are under 10, you know, three to eight, nine, 10 years old, they're concrete thinkers. Um, they need and deserve to have the truth. Um, and so um, that very simply <laughs> to, to answer your question, Liz, is why, why I think it's important because what we know, um, that's what we know that children need. And I, I understand and I struggled too with wanting to um, be euphemistic in some of my phrasing in the book um, because I worried that I was saying death too much. 
um, I worried that um, that it would that in reading the book aloud, that it would be too painful to say the word death and dying. But then as I got feedback on the manuscript from clinical psychologists and child grief specialists and child life specialists, I came to understand that actually, no, this is exactly what needs to be. And so I found comfort in that, you know, uh, in understanding that um, my vision for the story is that it would help families connect and have a shared language of loss without the the layered burden of religious um, euphemism. Um, and so that has been really freeing. Um, and like I said, has kind of allowed the book to be more widely used. Um, and I think a lot of people who, you know, say, oh, I might like to write a children's book or I might like to write about my own grief journey, um, you know, I think they might they might also be faced with that question of language. Um, and to them, I would say, you know, have the courage to be direct because the kids can handle it. They can. They really can. They're so they're adaptive and they're, you know, I was, I was thinking um, to our most recent loss, uh, our, our family dog of nine years passed away in June, really suddenly, very suddenly, right? And so for a lot of kids, that is kind of their first experience of loss. It's like a pet dies, right? Plenty of books, too, about how how Fido is in heaven. <laughs> We're all dogs go to heaven, right? Um, but yeah, exactly. But it actually offered us the most beautiful opportunity to um, to show our daughter um, what the grieving process can look like without those euphemisms, without saying he's in heaven now. We we buried his body together. She shoveled the dirt onto him and and we kind of we we did make a ritual of it in that it was it was about him and our relationship with him. We blew bubbles because he loved eating the bubbles. And we um, we wrote cards, you know, we wrote a letter to him and put it in a memory box. And um, that was all we needed. That was all we needed was just to feel that sense of connection with each other and with our memories of Henry. Um, and I, I did go to sleep a few nights wondering, like, is she going to, you know, ask about heaven now or be worried if, I don't know, if she'll ever see Henry again? And she was fine. <laughs> you know, she was fine. It really. <laughs> I didn't so much. <laughs> it really, I think, just telling them the truth is so much better because they have such wild and vivid imaginations that when you use those euphemisms and you kind of skirt around the issue, like they get more scared. Um, and when you are direct and truthful with them and do those types of things, like I think that story is beautiful. Um, it really helps them go through the process and see that it this is natural and something that will happen and we can all work through it together. Yeah, yes, absolutely. And I, I mean, and very sadly, like three weeks after we lost Henry, my grandfather died. And it was also kind of the first time I was, you know, I brought my children into his home and in the, uh, into his room in the nursing home. And he was in the act of dying phase, you know, and while it was sad, it again, kind of offered us the opportunity to acknowledge and to focus on the meaning of our relationship with him and our memories with him and how his body, while it's not going to work anymore, 
um, and will not be responsive, won't be able to hear us anymore, that um, we can still remember the love that we shared with him. Um, and so I don't think I've got it perfect. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't think I have this grieving process like with kids down, but I do know that the process of writing Goodbye Sister um, has absolutely helped me uh, help me feel prepared for those moments with my kids. Yeah. Well, and you do know children, um, being a teacher and being the former executive director of Camp Quest. I was telling Liz before the show, when I first met you um, at the Secular Coalition for America meeting like years ago, I said she walked into the room and she introduced herself and you just knew that she knew children and that she was like a camp counselor person. <laughs> like you just sort of exude that like camp counselor, like let me talk about children and you know how to connect with them. Um, and you gave a, a presentation later that day talking about like how to bring um, young people into our movement. And I just thought, wow, like she really knows how to do this. And um, so I think that comes through in this book. Like you know how to connect with children, you know how they think, and you know how to relate to them, um, especially given your, your personal experience with this. Thank so you. don't sell yourself short, I think. <laughs> I think you do know a little bit more on, on this topic. So can you tell us how the book has been received? Um, very wonderfully. I, I'm amazed every day. So right. So when you're the self publishing process is a little daunting because you kind of, you put it out there and you're your own marketing team and, and everything. And so I, um, I, I was so grateful that the, PLIDA conference, the PLIDA conference was um, as successful as it was. I mean, I sold every book that I brought with me within a day and a half. Um, I um, was then very fortunate this past June um, to also go to the National Alliance for Children's Grief Convention, um, where I shared it there. Um, and the audience um, has been expanding to include grief centers throughout the country to private practices um, and therapists who are finding the book and sharing it with their um, with their families and with children. Um, and so, I um, one of my dreams is to be able to have the book. Uh, to get more copies printed of the book so that I can make more direct donations to libraries and schools. That's my my kind of next step of the vision for for Goodbye Sister. Um, and my hope is that I can do that within the next year or two, um, because I think it's a story that that, um, you know, nobody wants to have to look it up. No one wants to have to buy it, but often, and I've had librarians say this, you know, to me, like, this is a book that, you know, we need on our shelves because people come in asking for this type of resource. Um, and so I'm, I'm grateful that the word is kind of getting out, um, about Goodbye Sister. Um, and that I continue to find avenues and ways to talk about and share my own story. And it's been very healing. Yeah. Um, Kim, you talked about your vision for um, getting your book into libraries and schools. Do you have any other books in mind? <laughs> I do. So I have, um, I have, a couple of working manuscripts right now that are also very different from Goodbye Sisters. So um, by being a self-publisher, it kind of necessitated that I start my own company. So, so, so I, I have particular books and my my vision is that I'll be able to produce my next book, which is actually about um, uh, my daughter Hazel and Henry, our our dog, um, who meet a new friend 
and um, their kind of their adventures together. I, I won't give away too much, but it kind of addresses bullying. Um, it, it, it addresses um, issues of diversity and inclusion. Um, and so, um, and it's a rhyming book. So it's, it's very different from Goodbye Sister, but still in the vein of wanting to offer a story to children, um, you know, who might be facing challenging questions of, uh, challenging issues of bullying and inclusion at school, which is something that I unfortunately see a lot of. Um, but my, my vision for the company for Journey Together Books is that I would love to be able to help other um, authors share their stories, um, particularly if they have a very specific niche story to share, like Goodbye Sister. Um, they're not necessarily going to find a traditional publisher for that, um, but it's absolutely doable to self-publish, and we need more of these stories. So um, I don't know where the journey is headed, but I, I know that by putting myself out there that I can make something happen. So that's that's part of my part of my vision, Liz, <laughs> is that I'll be able to both publish my future books and also help other people publish theirs. So in perusing your website, Journey Together Books, um, I noticed that you also have resources that are listed for families. Can you tell us a little bit about what is listed there? Yes, absolutely. So I um, I have listed a number of organizations, both in the U.S. and internationally, for families that um, are going through the grieving process and specifically for child and infant loss. Um, so I, as I learn of new organizations and as I find great resources and articles, I try and add them to my website. So I welcome anyone to reach out to me with, with others that they might like to share. Um, I also have been working with my illustrator, Ethan Roffler. He is a wonderfully talented um, artist and human being who lives out in Eastern Idaho. Um, and we collaborated for over a year on Goodbye Sister, just to kind of give you some insight to just how long that process took. Um, but we're now also collaborating on a line of bereavement cards for children, um, loss and bereavement cards. Um, because like, like books, there are not very many secular <laughs> cards for children going through these these challenging times. So, um, so we're working on that. Um, and yeah, so that's, that's a little bit of what else you can find on my website. Um, so just to clarify, those are sympathy cards that you sell on your website. People can right. go there and check those out. Um, yes. and yes. as you're shouting out to your illustrator, I'm so glad you mentioned him because I love the artwork. I think it's such a beautiful children's book and especially all the garden artwork. It's very Winnie the Pooh vibes and it's just it's just gorgeous. I love it. Thank you. Yeah, I I kind of as I was imagining as I was imagining how to tell a story of loss, um, I find comfort in in thinking of Katie's cemetery as a garden. In fact, when I was a kid, that's what I thought it was. You know, it's this this field, beautiful field of flowers. Like, what else could it be? It's a garden. And I always loved stories like The Secret Garden, um, you know, was one that I grew up with. And so I wanted the book to have this very warm and inviting feeling of walking into the garden. Um, and that tied in beautifully with you know, with being able to um, to th to think about the kind of natural process of death, you know, um, that we we come from the earth and go back to the earth. Um, and so gardening, um, gardening is a very important theme to the book and one that to me um, offered us the opportunity to um, just create some beautiful, beautiful illustrations. Um, so we're, 
where the character Kimmy, um, you know, is very involved in the garden and the making of the garden um, as part of her memory making process um, of remembering her sister. So it's beautiful, it's valuable, and let's just remind people where they can buy the book. Yes, you can purchase it from directly from me through my website, journeytogetherbooks.com. You can also find it on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. Um, and so any any major bookstore should it should pop up for you there. Um, on the on Amazon and Barnes and Noble, you'll find it on paperback. And if you order directly from me, I can get you a nice hardcover version. Um, and so these are good for gifting to local libraries and schools because they require the hard covers. Okay. Yep. Well, we do have questions from our audience. If you have some time to go through some of those. Um, I will start off with one from Monica L. How do you respond to fears that mom or dad or someone else may die in the future in response to someone a child knows dying? Mm -hmm. This is one that I sometimes get from my daughter, right? Sometimes she'll get into this mood of like, mommy, I'm afraid that you're going to die. <laughs> um, or I'm afraid of Harlow, her brother dying. Um, he's 15 months old. And so sometimes it's like, if he's got something in his mouth, it's like, oh, is he going to die? And I was like, no, it's going to be okay. Um, you know, uh, but the way that I respond is, is like, um, I just try to be honest. I say, you know what? Someday we'll all die. Um, there will come a time when I won't be here anymore, but I'm always going to be your mom. I'm always going to love you. And that day is hopefully a long, long way away. <laughs> you know, so I just, I try and frame it as something that is hopefully in the distant, far, far distant future. But I'm honest. And, and I and I say, you know, it, it's going to be okay. And if you're feeling scared about it, that's natural and normal. Sometimes I feel scared when I think about death, too. And then I just kind of sit there with it, you know, and usually she's the one that's comforting me. She's saying, mom, it'll be okay. You know? <laughs> and then she's like, let's go get some ice cream. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, let's do that. <laughs> yep, yep, they always make the situation better, I find. Um, but those are very similar things that I tell my children too when those types of questions mm -hmm. come up. But I also really like the idea that, you know, you're always gonna feel my love just through our memories and things like that. Um, you yeah. will always, um, that love survives death um, because of you. <laughs> um, yeah. Did you have something? No, I'm just thinking, um, and I've talked about this in our past grief shows, my own mom died um, pretty suddenly, you know, not an uncommon story, but a very rapid cancer progression um, journey that really took our breath away, mine and my siblings. And it was um, early 2020 um, and it was so hard and my kids are so young and she was such a great Grammy to them and it just was so painful. Um, and Kim, when you talked about your own just sadness and just inability to function um, during times of your grief around your brother's death, it sort of reminds me of that. And um, there's so much fear, you know, I want so badly to protect my children from um, the pain that I was feeling. Um, and you want it to, you know, there, there's a part of you that wants there to be euphemisms that make it easier for your children to bear. But um, reflecting back, you know, three years, it's, I, I, I'm so glad that um, the way we got through my grief, you know, with the kids, is is factual and stark even if it's not not um you know euphemistic because it helps them understand why their mommy is in so much pain um it's not it doesn't it doesn't confuse um you know with euphemisms that are or that are almost silver linings like 
heaven and an angel and the promise of togetherness again in a, in a real sense. Um, I think ultimately looking back on how hard or how much they saw me struggle and, and despair um, would have been so confusing and so inauthentic. And they're so intuitive, you know, they don't, you know, they're eight and six and a half now or almost seven. And it's just like, then why are, why is mommy so sad? Why can't mommy get out of bed um, if Grammy's, if she's going to see Grammy again someday or if Grammy's, you know, in a better place? Um, and so I, I feel comfort in knowing that um, they, un, you know, they, they have the information that is, is rational and that, and that makes sense in their little brains um, to explain why it's so hard. And then also in the fear, because they are always, of course, going to the place of, but I don't want you to die, mommy, and I'm scared that you're going to die. Um, and when we talk about those things that you both just mentioned um, that really just help you get through that moment of fear, um, I also, I feel, I feel good and proud that, that they've seen me experience that loss um, and that, that that's their model and that they understand that I'm okay and they'll be okay. That's right. I, you, 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 I think hit it on the head in that by being honest and living your full grief journey with them, they see that you survived, you know, and I, and I tell myself this too, is like, I, 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 never wanted to scare my daughter. You know, I never wanted her to see me in pain or to see me crying in the shower or, you know, having a panic attack in the middle of the night. Um, and all of those things happened and I couldn't protect her from those experiences. But I know that when she's older and I'm able to share about those times with her you know, in reflection that she'll, she will understand that. Um, I don't want to say that it made me stronger, <laughs> you know, like I, I don't want to take that, um, you know, particular, particular line with it, but just that, you know, that I, I survived it. And so when she has to go through something hard that she'll be able to survive it too, and that she won't necessarily have to cling to, um, religious narratives in order to do that. Um, and that kind of gets me back to, I'm always toggling between my, my parent brain and my author brain, um, and my teacher brain, um, that that's why it's so important that we use concrete terms, because if we are saying, um, you know, Grammy is in heaven, um, the children will perceive that as being an actual place that they can go to now, um, depending on their developmental stage. And so I think probably a lot of therapists have to undo some of that work <laughs> um, because it's very, com it's very confusing and is, is actually not the best thing to tell your child. Um, so, so yeah, I, well, absolutely will be there. That segues <laughs> greatly into this question. Um, you answered a little bit of it, but um, Angela W. writes, I have read that for really young children who may view someone who has died, such as in hospice or at a wake or some sort of similar setting, it is important not to say that the person who has died is asleep. Do you have suggestions on how to explain the concept that their body is still here, but they are no longer alive? Absolutely. So, and that is correct. Um, all of the evidence-based resources that I have read and the professionals I've talked to directly say, you know, it's very important to not confuse sleep with death. We know that when we go to sleep, we, our brains are still active. Um, we're dreaming um, sometimes we move in and out of that dream-like state, that REM cycle. Our lungs are still breathing. Our hearts are still beating. And we wake up. Um, and so to, you know, to have a child in a setting, whether it's hospice or even at a funeral home, 
um, you know, I think it's important to point out like the body isn't breathing anymore. There is not going to be any waking up. Um, you know, the heart isn't beating anymore and they can't feel anything. They can't hear us. Um, and sometimes it, uh, helps me too to sometimes make a connection to something that we find in nature like a dead bird or uh, an animal you know the, sometimes those are good opportunities to to talk with your child about what death looks like you know and the fact that humans um are the same <laughs> the when our bodies stop working we'll stop being responsive um and so so if if talking about the death of a human body feels uncomfortable to you, then I would say, you know, approach, maybe approach it with, with something that does feel a little more, a little more comforting, uh, not necessarily comforting, but more comfortable, like talking about an animal, um, or a bird, you know, and using those opportunities to kind of start the conversation. Great advice. We have yeah. one more question from a guy named okay. Dan Barker. Um, oh. Might have heard of him. <laughs> um, but his question is, if the child never really knew the baby or had any interaction with the baby, how does that kind of grief differ from grieving the death of someone you spent a lot of time getting to know? Oh, Dan, thank you so much for asking that question. Because for so long, I felt like my grief wasn't um, important enough to be recognized because, um, I never got to meet Katie. Um, and I think, um, uh, hospitals, um, uh, are more attuned to the importance of this now of having siblings there and present, um, after a stillbirth. Um, but I didn't have that. Um, but I think it's really important to acknowledge that we're not only grieving the loss of a life, but we're also grieving the loss of ourselves, of kind of the selves that we couldn't become, you know? I thought I was going to be a big sister, but then I wasn't, you know? Or, or I thought that I was going to be able to do these things things with my and and sort of in the book I I visit some of those those dreams you know the dreams of eating drippy ice cream cones or um, reading books together or looking for bugs under stones in the backyard um, and so I think it's important to acknowledge and that we grieve our dreams too we grieve our expectations um, we grieve the part of ourselves that never, that never was, um, or never can be, um, and that's okay, you know. And that grief is not any less than, um, than if you had a relationship with that child, um, and so, yeah. That's, I think, part the part of my grief process that has maybe been the most hard for me to articulate um, because the way I became a big sister <laughs> was, was not what I was expecting, you know? And I think that whether you're a sibling or a parent, too, you know, the way you become a mother, you know, you don't have control over that um, all the time. Right. So, um, so I think that it's important to, to keep that part of the conversation, you know, that it's okay to, to grieve the experiences you couldn't have. And if yeah. we're, if we're, you know, honest and thinking about grief in broader terms, um, that's such a big part of grieving for people who, you also had many years with, right? I mean, my mom died at 62. And the the most painful thing that I think about when I think about her death is all of the things not done and all of the years with her grandkids that 
she won't get to experience in all of the, the dreams that we had for those relationships that are unfulfilled. And so um, it's, it's that pain is so profound and there's no reason to think that it should be of a different, you know, quality or um, importance um, just because, you know, we're talking about someone you had no living years with um, or a couple. Um, yeah. It's I, I think it's one of the things too that makes child loss um, so painful and so difficult, I think too, for religious communities to deal with. Um, because how can you explain that a loving God would, you know, take away the life of a child? Um, and, you know, and I think, too, it speaks to just how powerful our evolutionary mechanisms are, that we are constantly trying to make meaning and to look to the future and to anticipate and to dream and that when we don't have those people in our lives who we want to make those dreams with, you know, or have a future with, um, that that is by necessity a huge part of our processing of that loss and grief. Um, and I think all the more reason why it's important for secular communities to talk about this, because I think that until we learn to make grief and grieving and providing supportive communities for families and grief a priority that um, we will always struggle to um, find relevance for people's in people's lives you know um, so, so i've i've had the privilege of talking with and meeting with all kinds of families um, and children, and I think that this is one area where, um, where I think that there's a huge unmet need, um, and so it's it's why I am and continue to be grateful for organizations like FFRF, um, because you're you're making space for this conversation when still a lot of secular and humanist groups aren't. <laughs> Mm -hmm. well, I have thoroughly enjoyed our conversation to do today. I agree with you. I think it's something that we should be talking a lot about, and I hope that we are able to continue to do that. I'm really excited to see where Journey Together Books goes, um, and, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank and you very much. Buy the book. <laughs> Goodbye, sister. Go buy it. <laughs> Yes. yes, please. Yes, please. And if you're interested in supporting me and my vision of um, getting uh, a thousand books printed and out to hospitals and libraries, I would love to hear from you. Um, and in the meantime, you can order it um, through Amazon or through my website, Journey Together Books. And I would love to hear from you to hear your stories and how Goodbye Sister is helping you in your grief journey. Yeah. Thank you, Thank Kim. Thank you so much. Thank so you. that concludes Ask an Atheist for this week. And this week on our broadcast TV show, Free Thought Matters, our guest was John Ward, author of the book Testimony Inside the Evangelical Movement That Failed a Generation. Check out a preview. My father was involved in leading protests outside abortion clinics when I was a, a, a child. That was the only real political issue that we cared about because we spent most of our time thinking about uh, and going to church and, and thinking about the Bible and talking about God and politics was something sort of dirty and not worth our time. That was, you know, our my unique experience. Not every church is like that. But um, as a result, you know, our politics was very uh, immature very um, one-dimensional, um, and so all of our voting was shaped around that one issue. Um, and uh, you know, I think that's I think that is representative of a lot of uh, religious conservative voters in America. You can see Free Thought Matters on TV stations all across the U.S. and also on FFRF's Facebook and YouTube channels. 
Be sure to catch Free Thought Radio. This week, Annie Laurie Gaylor and Dan Barker will be examining the Ten Commandments with a critical eye and discovering what's wrong with them. You can find out how to hear Free Thought Radio at ffrf.org slash radio. And be sure to catch the latest episode of the We Dissent podcast where you can hear Allison Gill, Rebecca, and me discuss legislative bills in Texas messing with civil rights of students in public schools. You can find that anywhere you get your favorite podcasts. You can check us out online at we-descent.org. And if you want more information about the Freedom From Religion Foundation, check out our website at ffrf.org. If you're a member already, thank you. If not, please join us. We'll see you next week on FFRF's Ask an Atheist.